Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is uh, Valeria Ramiconi, and I'm program manager at uh, IFA, the European Federation of Allergy and Airways Disease Patients Association. I will be your moderator today for this event, organized in the framework of the European Parliament Interest Group on Allergy and Asthma. Thank to, thanks to all of you, uh, the participants that are with us today at the European Parliament, and those that follow us online from across Europe. Over its seven years of existence, the Interest Group on Allergy and Asthma has served members of the European Parliament to promote allergy and asthma health in Europe. We are delighted to count on 24 MEPs who currently integrate the Interest Group and who have made it a well-recognized forum uh, of health prevention and care expertise within the EU institutions. During the next two hours, we will learn more on the huge impact of bioaerosol on human health, building to the major chronic disease such as allergy and asthma that costs around 50 to 150 billion of euros annually. This is because over 100 million of Europeans live with allergy, allergic rhinitis and or asthma, making the most common non-communicable disease for children and the second most common for adults. We will start the, uh, the meeting today, the event today, with an introduction of one of our co-host member of the European Parliament, Mr. Gonzalez Olekas. We then have a set of presentations that will enlighten us with the latest science on bioaerosols and their link with allergy and asthma. Thank you to all our excellent speakers that are with us today. We look forward to learning from you. Finally, we will unveil the joint statement that will certify the clear impetus this group has to include bioaerosols bio and their impact on allergy and asthma as an area to be embedded into the One Health. We, then, we will then move into a discussion with the audience. So for all our participants online, please do not hesitate to ask questions to our speaker uh, via the chat function of um, WebEx, I think this platform, yes. <laughs> for the sake of the flow of the discussion, we will take all your, uh, your questions at the end uh, of the presentations, but please feel free to type your questions or comments throughout the whole session. <coughs> In case of any technical problems, please use the chat function and my colleagues, uh, Vaida and Alessandra, will guide you through. And of course, for the participants attending here at the European Parliament, uh, feel free to ask questions raising your hands uh, when uh, the roundtable uh, will start. So if you wish to report on this, uh, on this event on social media, please do using the hashtag EPAllergyAsma. So, without further delay, I would like to invite Mr. Guozas Olekas to open this event. So, Mr. Olekas is a member of the European Parliament within the Socialist and Democrats group since 2019, and he is also the Vice Chair of the Interest Group on Allergy and Asthma. He is a Lithuanian surgeon and politician and a former Minister of National Defence from 2006 to 2008. In 1990 and from 2003 to 2004, he also served as a Health Minister. So, Mr. Olekas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valeria, for so kind introduction. And a honor and pleasure for me to be a co-host of this uh, conference. And as you said, being a medical doctor, I should say that biorosol uh, are fundamental to the life of uh, on art and integral to one health. They have a, a huge impact on human health linked to common diseases such as uh, allergy and uh, asthma, as well as on the agriculture, uh, destroying crops and causing environmental damage through the use of fungicide. Much better? Okay. Yes, now <laughs> okay. you're in camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The associated uh, cost uh, to society run into hundreds of billions per, per year. But there is a large demand for information about the aeroallergens. Currently, it is hard to obtain as it is often uh, inconsistent, scattered, and uh, not available in the timely manner. Trust and real information need to be accessible uh, to the public and integrate both risk levels and mitigation uh, measures. 
This requires improved monitoring, forecasting, and communication tools. Climate change has already strongly impacted the lives of LNG uh, patients, as it contributes to early and longer uh, pollen seasons, a dramatic increased uh, aeroallergen concentration, and uh, uh, exposure to new mixes of allergens through changing plant distributions. This phenomenon is expected only to accelerate in the coming years, as global warming continues to worsen and more people become uh, sensitive. Despite air quality being uh, extensively monitored across the, uh, Europe, its biological components, including uh, aeroallergens, are largely ignored despite their importance for, for human uh, health, climate, and the environment. Timely information can reduce these uh, impacts and contribute to effective mitigation strategies across many domains, including human and environmental health, as well as agriculture and biodiversity. Including uh, BRLs also in European legislation would provide a mandate to ensure a continuous monitoring and provide information that would improve quality of life, uh, enhance biodiversity, and could save uh, millions of euros per year. Today we are going to discuss these uh, problems, and I'm very happy to see such a great group of experts around this table and big community uh, of interest people joining us online. I hope we have a very fruitful uh, discussion and uh, achieve results and uh, our uh, comments on, on that issue. Thank you very much for being together today. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mr. Olekas. And um, I would also like to, to thank uh, Mrs. Sirpa Petikainen, which uh, he's the, uh, an MEP and is also the chair of the interest group, but who couldn't be here today because she's traveling. Thank you so much. And now i um, delight to introduce our first presenter, uh, Professor Isabella Annesi Maisano. So Professor Anesi Maisano is a respiratory epidemiologist by training who studied physics and medicine. She's a researcher director at INSER and, um, and professor of environmental epidemiology. She's deputy director of the Desbrest Des Des Institute of Epidemiology and Public Health, a joint research unit between INSERM and the University of Montpellier. Uh, her research focuses on explain allergy and respiratory disease and associated comorbidities through the exposome approach. The main risk factor considered are air pollution and climate change. Professor Anesi Maisano has published over 600 articles, including two books on respiratory epidemiology and has won three uh, major international awards thanks to her research. So Professor, is really we are delighted to have you here with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Valeria, very much for this nice introduction. And also, many thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Olegas, because you said uh, many of the things that I'm going to say. So very briefly, I'm introducing uh, what is a bioaerosol. Uh, and uh, next, uh, please. And then uh, giving you only some example, I think it's uh, really important to discuss. These are my disclosure, two smalls, but I'm in many public institutions uh, working on uh, bioaerosol, uh, epidemiology, public health, uh, and et cetera. Including in France, in this uh, Réseau National de Surveillance Aerobiologique, uh, that is uh, really important, that is uh, unfortunately not really public, it's a, 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 a special uh, uh, constitution. Next, uh, please. So, uh, very simple, barrio aerosol. I'm talking about uh, the outdoors, what we can find uh, outdoors. Indoors, we have uh, many others that are still uh, dangerous for asthma and allergy. They are particles of droplets that contain living organisms or they bioproducts, pollen, fungi, molds, bacteria, viruses, uh, just to mention the most important, uh, that are dispersed, uh, dispersed in the air through various natural 
and the human activities so we can think that the human activities can be uh, controlled better than the natural in some places playing a significant role as I'm going to indicate to you in environmental public health. You have on the right the picture of something in my doctor will tell you how you can do that, but you can take a sample in the air, and then once you check what you have inside, you have many things. We have pollen, you have molds, uh, and also particle, chemical pollutants. And I included also, because uh, this unfortunately was a really up to date, uh, the very famous SARS CoV 2. Uh, so the sources of these uh, uh, products um, are uh, many. I'm indicating the most important for the pollens and animals philos plants, pollens go with the wind. I will show to you a picture on that. Leaves or the other vegetation decomposition for molds. Human and animal infection in the case of the virus bacteria. And I'm not, obviously, I'm really restricting, unfortunately, to what I know in some way. Next slide, please. And uh, obviously, the One Health approach uh, is uh, essential because, uh, as uh, you have already seen, uh, they are in the air, these bio areas, so they interact with the men, with the animals, uh, with the soil, with the nature. So to study all these, we need really a multidisciplinary approach. Next. So effect of bio areas also on health are both positive and negative. And depend also on the settings we are considering. In the case of natural environment, they are essential for biological reproduction. They are involved in the process of cloud formation through microparticles and precipitation, so they can influence weather patterns, ecosystem dynamics, and thus also biodiversity but they are carriers for plant pathogens, aiding in the spread of diseases among the crops or forests, for example. In the case of animal, but I don't know when veterinary medicine, so this is really schematic, they have an impact on the immune system, respiratory diseases, infection. And in the case of health, that's important. We are here to talk about asthma allergies, but Unfortunately, these bio areas also have had many other effects. And these effects are on the immune system, allergy, other respiratory diseases that can be very um, dangerous for the patient, including, for example, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis or infection, or even a systemic diseases like headache and fatigue. Next, please. So focusing on the case of asthma and allergy, next, please. This has already been said, but uh, there are 150 million uh, European citizens that suffer from a chronic, uh, a chronic uh, um, allergic asthma or allergic diseases. Uh, these uh, can be uh, divided in 100 suffering from uh, rhinitis, 7,000 suffering for asthma because there is an overlap very well known from the medical point of view between rhinitis and asthma. This disease by 2025, and we have really to think about that, will be uh, present in one out of two citizens in Europe. Can you put the, and in the world, this will be reached by 2050. There is a shift. Developing countries are becoming allergic. So everything we will shift. You have the case of very severe uh, uh, allergic diseases in Europe, 7 million, eight, uh, percent of these have what is called anaphylactic shock. So people that go to the hospital because of their life is engendered. And you have the cost, but Valeria, both Valeria and our deputy mentioned that there are 
there is the absenteeism. What is interesting is that if we stop this progression, we can earn 142 billions of euro. Uh, so this is important. And the figure for uh, the world uh, are, uh, for me, the most important is that every day we have uh, more than 1,000 people that die from asthma, and this is inevitable that people can go to the hospital, can be treated, because we know how to do. But still, in, uh, unfortunately, less affluent classes, and is really related also to ethnic group, there are people dying of asthma. Next, please. So this is a very recent uh, work with uh, my <laughs> colleague and friends, uh, Professor Damian, uh, published this year on what was uh, not really so well uh, known. So uh, pollen, which is one of uh, the major barriers, bio areas of implicating asthma and allergies, not only related to pollen. It's related also to asthma. Asthma is a, a more severe disease. So we make a, a study of all the publication in the literature. Could uh, reply, please, in the next, saying uh, it's boring. I'm not showing. Uh, can you click? I'm not going to show. I give it just the results. We found what we call in epidemiology significant association between being exposed to pollen that were objectively assessed in this study. In each study, we had the amount of pollen and asthma hospitalization or admission. This means acute asthma. Okay, you don't go to the hospital if you are just a coffee. You go to the hospital because your lung function is going down. So next, please. Obviously, I'm not saying anything about moles, but they are also very dangerous, and if there are questions. So the problem is that, unfortunately, the situation is not stationary. The situation is moving, is putting our patient, a new patient, potential patient, a danger of uh, having uh, uh, asthma and allergy. Why? One of the main reasons is that the environment is becoming more toxic, and it's becoming more toxic, among others, because of the climate change. And so more pollen, in the case of pollen, and more asthma, and allergy. Next, please. So some example of what uh, Dr. Oleg has already said. This is an example of extreme event, wind going from Russia to Iceland and bringing birch pollen. I think you see a little bit of a rose in the clouds on the left. So what happened? happened what uh, now we call uh, a pollen bomb in Iceland. An amount, exaggerated amount of pollen in a place where people were already allergic to pollen, but because of uh, so many pollens, even people with uh, a threshold of uh, sensitivity lower had asthma, and uh, rhinitis. Next, please. This is uh, something which is uh, new, still uh, related to extreme events uh, due to climate change. It's uh, the so-called thunderstorm asthma. This uh, is a figure uh, from, uh, mm, 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 sorry, Melbourne in Australia, where they had 9,000 people going to the hospital because of asthma attacks following uh, pollen dispersion just before a thunderstorm. Because before a thunderstorm, you have a turbulence air. It's what you can see probably not so well in the left part of this picture. You have the pollen going up, fragmentating and going down, and then entering, because of the air small, in the bronchitis, the people. So people with rhinitis or some uh, sensi allergic sensitization to pollen react, and in this case, they had nine deaths. Once again, asthma 
that is avoidable. And this year we had this in France, not that, but a lot of people going to the emergency room department because of asthma. And what is in the new novelty, sorry to have it used, is not in the good way, is that in France we had the people that were very well known asthmatics, controlled asthmatics, but because of an excess in pollen, they had a severe asthma attacks. Next. So, but uh, in general, because uh, to the uh, temperature that uh, increase, uh, the plant can move, adapt, go extinct. So the, the, as a consequence, there is an expected distribution of uh, pollen and allergen touching people that have the predisposition, but not uh, the allergy manifestation. Next, please. And uh, two other characteristics that because of, uh, of a warmer weather that send signals to plants to bloom, pollen season start earlier, last longer. And on the right, you had the water we had on 26th of May this year, the bomb. We call it that the pollen bomb. Everything is red, red. This means, except in Brittany, if you recognize a little bit, uh, know the, the French geography, that was for grass. And so everyone was exposed. And also we know that because greenhouse emission increases the atmospheric level of a carbon dioxide, uh, there is uh, also a higher increase in production and release of pollen and the allergenicity increase uh, also. Next, please. So, but what uh, we will have also as a consequence of climate change, uh, yes, it's a perfect, uh, is uh, an interaction between uh, pollen and air pollution. Air pollution is increasing uh, due to climate change because of ozone, because of the temperature, higher temperature, the particle because of droughtness or other um, even natural uh, manifestation and NO2, uh, the nitrogen dioxide because of, of the increase in the urbanization that follows migration people and uh, is a typical event of uh, climate change. So here you have uh, what can happen to pollen once uh, they meet uh, air pollution. There are two ways. Uh, the easy way is that there is absorption of the allen that come out from the uh, humidity, uh, pollen emitting humidity. Uh, they are bound to particles and uh, click please. And on the other side, uh, what we can call uh, the allergenic uh, extrusion, uh, so an allergenic aerosol, click uh, please, and then uh, go to the others, so just uh, some uh, picture, next. So here is the first case, you can easily see that uh, you have uh, a mixture of uh, particles, pollen, the year you have also molds, so something in the air, belonging to bioreals also that can be inhaled. The next, please. And here is a, even more uh, impressive, uh, is an experimental uh, study. Uh, when you use a spray on a pollen, the actin, which is the external membrane, breaks. And then you have a the extrusion of small particles, and these small particles enter in the airways deeply. And this is why there is asthma. Next. So, but uh, unfortunately, there are uh, other factors to report. And the, the one I want to report is uh, also this uh, aerosol uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and uh, pollen or air pollution. So here 
very simply, air pollution affects the membrane, the epithelium, so that uh, virus enter more easily. But what is less known is that uh, air pollution, in the case of uh, some chronic diseases, uh, is also the origin of an increase of uh, this uh, angioconverting enzyme that is needed to SARS-CoV-2 to enter in the cells. And uh, the, what is uh, uh, interesting is that these comorbidities with higher uh, AC2 are the same comorbidity that put people with the COVID at higher risk of a severe form of the disease. And on the right part of this picture, there is also something like, in the case of pollen, in this bioaerosol that can be found, but actually I want to be very cautious. There are some studies that have pumped the air and found the COVID disaster in the air, but we need to be uh, to, to be more precise in studies. Next, please. And then uh, what uh, this was a very important publication by uh, Thanos Mihalis, he will report uh, on that, but showing that uh, the pollen can decrease the imme immunity of the people. This belongs to this uh, balance between a TH1 and a TH2. If you are allergic, you are TH2. If you want to fight the infection, to, uh, you have to be TH1. So the balance uh, is unbalanced, actually. And what, uh, but also Michael, sorry, I forget the Sophia was there. And I have to finish, but uh, they show very nicely that uh, there was uh, a relationship between the two. So in some way, pollen can win you. Next, please. So I think uh, we have to think that these are bioaerosols are not uh, isolated factors, that they belong to what uh, I call uh, the exposome, that we need to take into account all the interaction. The next, and uh, a comprehensive interdisciplinary uh, approach is necessary. And then uh, we finish the last one with the K measure, just uh, giving some title. We need monitoring and surveillance. Uh, Professor Schiotti is going to show how. We need the risk assessment. We need the control and mitigation strategies, education and awareness. I teach to medical, to future medical doctor, and I'm really impressed that sometimes they don't know anything. Sorry to have to say that. We don't teach enough. And obviously, we need research and innovation and also funding to do that. Many thanks. It's the last. So the approach, you can leave on the present previous. OK. That's, uh, you can read uh, what I think is useful is that uh, we need to adopt uh, this uh, one health approach uh, considering the interconnectedness of human health, animal health, and uh, the environment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. I think that um, I'm sure that our uh, attendees and the audience here has already some questions, but please, uh, keep them until the end of the, all the presentations and also for those who are following online. Uh, start writing your questions in the chat. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Vincent-Henri Puch. I hope that I'm not butchering your surname, but I'm doing my best. Uh, so he's the director of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. And Dr. Puch is on joining us online today. He couldn't be here in Brussels with us. Um, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Um, so he's also the head of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Services and deputy director of the Copernicus Department at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast. He has been involved in the design and development of the European Copernicus program for over a decade. So um, it's really a pleasure to have you here and welcome virtually to the uh, European Parliament. The floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to uh, contribute to set set the scene. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Professor uh, Anesi uh, presented very well uh, the, the the threats uh, that are around and the increased level of threats with uh, with climate change. I, I will come with. Uh, uh, not a solution, but uh, a, a realization uh, that uh, the amount of environmental data that is becoming available to study the uh, connection between a changing environments and uh, uh, and health outcomes uh, is uh, is is improving. Next slide, please. So we we all been used for uh, many decades uh, to have uh, on the tip of our fingers uh, weather information uh, that has been ubiquitous a bit everywhere. But what is maybe less known because it has happened uh, in, in in the last few years, uh, maybe partly also uh, during the COVID period, is that the wealth of environmental data that is uh, now available in in real time has increased a, a lot. Uh, in particular, uh, I, I, I think that Copernicus uh, in Europe uh, has played a role, and, and now it's much more frequent that you can see on leading uh, broadcast TV uh, or uh, smartphone application information about a lot of environmental data, uh, not only weather, uh, climate information. Uh, at the end of each month, you can see uh, uh, statistics about uh, what has been ongoing in the months, not only in terms of temperature, but also uh, vegetation, uh, wetness of soils and uh, air, air composition and 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 the, the, the picture i would like to to comment is the one on on the bottom it's it's a, a forecast for for today where you see this uh, yellowish uh, uh, tongue of uh, aerosol in in this case in this case it's the uh, uh, the, the, the wildfires from Canada that are making their way uh, up to uh, almost yeah to to Europe and to uh, to uh, to the Brussels area. In, in this case, it's in altitude, so not affecting uh, uh, health directly. But just to illustrate that there is a lot of data that is uh, that is available. Next slide. So why this data has become available? Uh, it's a result of lots of uh, research, but also of. Uh, uh, things that have been unlocked fairly recently. Uh, one big aspect uh, is Earth observation. So satellites uh, are measuring many, many more parameters than they did in, in the past, focusing in, in this case uh, only on air quality. There are two things that I would like to, to highlight. One is the, the monitoring of pollutants like uh, nitrogen dioxide, NO2. You can see this uh, map of China uh, before and after the, 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 the start of the lockdown. Actually, it was the, the main illustration worldwide of uh, uh, the way the different uh, lockdown were established in, in the world. So satellites uh, have, have now a lot of information that is uh, readily available in, in real time. And there is another change which is, uh, which is uh, already in, uh, uh, underway, which is uh, not only its uh, observation in the sense of one observation per day, uh, like uh, we have with uh, polar orbiting satellites, but also uh, now there is uh, uh, there are just stationary satellites that uh, look at parts of the Earth uh, with uh, hourly or better uh, revisit. So it, it means that there is a lot more data that can go into uh, providing environmental information as a support to health uh, impact studies, for instance. Next slide. And that's my, my, my next slide to say that in, in parallel of this uh, growth in uh, data that is uh, becoming available, uh, the methodologies uh, that are used either uh, in research or in more operation mode, for instance, for the WHO Global Burden of Diseases, have uh, also uh, bloomed uh, in, in recent years. It's not new. Uh, things had started long ago, but now with uh, artificial intelligence in particular, it becomes much more, uh, and the increased amount and variety of data, it becomes uh, uh, really much more uh, tractable to, to look at certain health impacts uh, uh, in, in greater depth. For instance, uh, one aspect that WHO is, uh, is working on is to try disentangle uh, the different uh, components of PM2.5 by highlighting what is uh, uh, dust, sarin dust, uh, from from other type of PM2.5, because of course the drivers uh, behind uh, sarin dust are very different from the drivers of uh, other types of, of of particles. So this leads me to my uh, to my next slide. So what about uh, pollens? Next slide, please. So what can we do about uh, bio uh, previous? Yes, what can we do uh, about uh, pollen, bioaerosol? Can we use the same um, approach that is used for air quality 
monitoring and, and forecasting. Uh, the first thing to, to note uh, is that uh, there is a need for a specific uh, additions to the model we have, especially in the form of emission models. So there must be a, a development of uh, models for how, thing, how, how the different uh, species will flower, how the uh, intensity uh, of the, the flowering will, will evolve, and also some statistics, uh, stochastic uh, component to uh, reflect that every uh, tree is, uh, is, is, is different. And then once we have these emission factors, uh, then we can use, of course, the, the model initially developed for fine particulate matter to assess the fate of bioaerosol in the atmosphere. So unlocking the possibility, for instance, to uh, study in detail uh, events like the one that uh, Isabella uh, showed uh, with a transport uh, from, uh, from Russia to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to Iceland. Next slide. So we have now, as part of, uh, of Copernicus, uh, operational forecasts uh, that are provided daily for six uh, species, uh, up to four days in advance. So you have here the species, birch, grass, uh, olive, ragweed, alder, and, and mugwort. Uh, it is based not only on one model, but it's based on an ensemble of 11 individual systems that have all, each their strength uh, and, and weaknesses. They are operated uh, across Europe and uh, data is, uh, is, is compiled uh, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in real time. So this is, if you want, a, a kind of a premier league for uh, air pollution and pollen forecasting in, in Europe. Very importantly, the data is all free and open, so everybody is, uh, uh, is able to get not only the, the images, but also the, the data. And uh, Mikhail Sofiev in his presentation will explain a bit more about uh, this, uh, this modeling and about, uh, very importantly, the quality of uh, the, the forecasts that are, not, that, that are now uh, available. Next slide. And I think that's my last slide uh, to say that uh, in, in Copernicus, we have set up uh, fairly recently uh, so-called thematic hubs. Uh, and there is one hub uh, that has opened uh, recently, which is called the Health Hub. And it's, uh, it's a portal where you will find access to uh, all the data uh, we, we think uh, is, avail is uh, useful for the health sector from Copernicus, so you will find data about pollen, so the one that I was mentioning, but also about air pollution, about climate, about vegetation, and uh, all the different components uh, that uh, can be useful for, uh, for making uh, health studies or for preparing uh, uh, health uh, risk uh, assessments. So the, the link is here, uh, health.hub.copernicus.eu, and, and I really invite you to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to look at this website, as uh, there is quite a lot of, of data that is uh, available for uh, open and, and, and free. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pork. And um, I think that is starting to be very clear how much uh, the, the interlink between all these factors and how important it is to include bioaerosol in the One Health uh, approach. Now, it's really uh, my pleasure to, to introduce, to, to come back to Earth, because now uh, Dr. Perk um, gave us some uh, amazing pictures and uh, uh, figures of the atmosphere. Now, let's go back to Earth and uh, let's move on to um, learn what are the latest innovation, innovation on the detection of bioaerosols um, bioaerosols, and so I'm very happy to introduce our new uh, speaker, uh, Professor Carsten Ambelas Kjot. Um, Professor Kjot works at the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. He is a specialist on atmospheric measurements and uh, specially on the use of real time instruments and molecular genetics lab facilities to develop new ways of detecting, measuring, and identifying what's in the air. He looks into the bioaerosols, the release, the transport, the transformation and deposition, and how this impacts the environment. So, Professor Skjold, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, then, yes, thank you very much. And um, when we're talking about state of the art on detection technologies, then I would like to first introduce uh, the backbone of the European network, how we do it today. Then we move to the DNA methods. So they're also laboratory-based as uh, the existing network today. 
that will be on uh, qPCR sequencing. Uh, then we'll move to real-time methods such as lasers, image recognition, holograms, etc. But before we move to into uh, the detection approach, then exactly what are we trying to detect? And in this case here, uh, have this info box about biosols. What are they, and why are they so tricky to measure? So I have five figures here, um, and uh, a figure taken from a paper published in 2016. And let's start from the left. So that is supposed to illustrate uh, proteins, free proteins in the air. And uh, the size is very, very small. We are talking about a few uh, nanometers. And if we go to figure number B, that could be um, a virus as an example, 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers. We go to the next scale, that will be bacteria. We have an example here from a maybe a half a micrometer to a few micrometers. Going to the next one again, we're talking about fungal spores, typically from about two, three microns and up to maybe 20, but some of them are actually quite long. They can be 100 microns long. And then we take the largest one, typically that would be the pollen grains, typically from, say, well, minimum 10, 12 microns and up to, say, 40. Those are the ones we typically find airborne, but we also find them larger. I have also a scale down there, uh, and here we can try to illustrate, it's quite small on the screen here, that this scale from the proteins, well, they're slightly larger than the, the gas molecules, but then we move to the virus, bacteria, spores, and pollen, and compared with something we know, that can be something like sulfate particles, secondary, uh, secondary organic aerosols, mineral dust, sea spray, so a really, really large scale. And this is one of the challenges we have once we start to detect, because very few instruments, if any at all, are actually designed to detect the full size range efficiently. So also, if we're going to specific instruments, they are typically impacted by sampling efficiency. So this means that if an uh, instrument is efficient in capturing pollen grains, then it will typically be less efficient in capturing some of the fungal spores, even less with the bacteria, and maybe not capture, uh, say, virus at all. Similar uh, in the other way around. So again, we have to choose our instrument once we have decided what we are after. Next one, please. So if we're looking into the backbone of the European Pollen Spore Network, I have a figure here in the middle. Uh, so this is an impactor. It's a book, a trap of the Hearst design, and um, I have also a schematic figure upright. So it's a relatively simple instrument with a big wind wane, and then it has an inlet or is an orifice, that in, and the wind uh, wane ensures that orifice is kept up against the wind, and when it sucks in the air, the particles are actually impacted uh, inside. And I have on the top right, in the top right corner, we have the inner part of the instrument, there's a so-called drum, that's the round part we see here. We cover that with tape, which we have also covered with a sticky surface, this can be Vaseline. And once uh, the particles are coming into the, into the instrument, they are impacted onto the drum. The drum then rotates, which means we'll get time-resolved data. We can then analyze those in the laboratory, we can take the tape out, put it onto a glass slide, and analyze this. We do this all over Europe today, and we have specialists trained in all over Europe to look into these glass slides to say, is this a grass pollen, is this an alternaria fungal spore, is this a burst pollen, and they count the, the numbers, and they also separate them into species. If you're looking into the pros and cons in this case here, while well, the instrument itself is limited in temporal detail due to the accuracy. The strengths, while well, actually it's a simple instrument, so limited effort to collect samples, uh, and we have a very large network. So the instrument is less expensive compared to other instruments and is quite robust. I have a figure to the lower right that shows a map over Europe and Africa, and especially in Europe, we have a lot of blue dots. That shows the location at some states. This instrument has been used on those locations. So uh, all of Europe has been covered well with the instrument, but say we have fewer stations that have been operated for a long time. But I think most countries today, they have actually decade long time series. So it's very valuable with respect to data. The weakness, it is labor intensive. So 
requires a lot of laboratory work to do this at every location. There's also uncertainty linked to individuals. So we have a trained specialist that identify what we have on the glass side, what has been captured. If we get another trained specialist, we'll get another result. Close, but still it will be different. And it's time consuming. The cutoff for the smaller biosols is unclear. And we have some limited taxonomical detail. So we can see grass pollen, but we can't see the individual grass species. We can see some fungal spores, but we can't see the individual species. We can see birch pollen as an example. And then there's availability. In some cases, the data can be, say, a few hours old. Sometimes, well, it can be up to seven days old. And uh, if you're suffering from hay fever, then we know that actually, that well, uh, it's important to know what is out now and what, how it's going to be tomorrow. So getting information about how it was yesterday or two days ago, well, yes, I know that, but please tell me what it is now. So next slide, please. So one of the alternatives we have to detect, that would be DNA methods. So in this case here, we have um, uh, the collection material, then we can use a range of different instruments, the figure and the chop. Uh, top just shows a number of different instruments we have. So it can be wet and dry cyclones. So that's the left part of the figure. In this case here, air is uh, circulated in, um, in, let's say in, a, in, a, in a motion, and then you have the particles typically deposited in vials. You can also use uh, a liquid, and then the particles are deposited in a liquid. We can have impactors, we can have filters. The middle one, in the top again, that shows a cascade sampler where we actually have a series of filters. Mm. The air is coming from the top and then it's moving through different filters with different pore sizes and then they retain uh, a certain uh, size fraction of the biosol. We have another type of uh, cascade sampler again to the right that can show us uh, using impaction. These samplers, they can sample from everything from one liters per minute and up to a full cubic meter uh, per minute. So a wide range from low volume samplers to high volume samplers. Once we have the data, we can analyze them in the lab using molecular approaches or the DNA approaches. I will say typically we have two approaches. We have a process where we scan the sample for everything we have inside. We can choose to go for scanning for uh, all uh, the type of biosols, bacteria, virus, fungal spores, pollen grains, or we can choose to have a subset with slightly higher accuracy, for example. So this provides the relative variation of what we have in our sample between the different species or presence absence. We can also use um, specific uh, methods where we, with even higher accuracy, target one specific species. And here we can target species with very, very high accuracy. I have a result um, lower right on, from DNA barcoding. So that's the scanning technique. And the wheel top right uh, in the figure shows uh, results from this uh, technique on an air sample from Switzerland. The colors corresponding to one, two, and three, they are extremely well uh, identified from a taxonomic point of view. I made a zoom, which is the figure lower left, where you can see all the green uh, boxes here, number of different Cladosporium species, Cladosporium herbarium as an example. But if you compare this with the microscope, this is not possible. Here, the microscope, we usually uh, classify Cladosporium, that is at another uh, taxonomical level. If you go to the pros and cons with this technique, it's limited in temporal detail. The strength is certainly that um, limited effort to collect the samples, and we have very high taxonomical detail. We can see specific pollen types, specific spores, specific bacteria, specific virus. And the sampling can be optimized to the target. Remembering again, there's no, uh, there's no instrument that samples everything extremely efficiently, so we can choose our sampler towards the target. The weakness is time consuming, and um, there's also a consumable cost, and sadly this is quite variable, and it tends to scale with the sample numbers. So if you want to analyze a lot of samples, it can become very expensive. Sometimes it also requires a specialist laboratory to, for example, cont um, prevent contamination. Then there's also the large variation in sampling methods. It complicates things. We have a number of different instruments compared to the backbone of the European network, focusing on one type of instrument. 
Finally, if we are using the scanning approach for everything we have in the sample, this requires huge libraries. And sadly, they are incomplete. They are getting bigger every day, but they're still incomplete. We can also say, but why is this important? Well, some biosols, they are morphologically identical. If you look into the microscope, grasses is a very good example. Fungal spores is another good example. And they can contain different analogies. Same with pathogens. And in some cases, they can be both an allergen and a pathogen. So that's the reason why DNA methods, they can be important. Next slide, please. So another approach to detect is real-time methods. The figure top right is uh, an example of the different technologies we have on the market today. And uh, we have three different technologies. And um, the top left, that's real-time uh, image recognition. So really, it's uh, try to replicate, automate what we're doing with the microscope. So here you can see the pollen grains quite easily. But there's another technique. That's real-time laser scattering. And on top of that, it also uses fluorescence technology when you excite the particle and then you see uh, how it behaves. So that's the middle figure again. So it's a different technology. And then the right figure, that is the hologram recognition, also using fluorescence. But all these technologies, they don't work unless we have a mathematical model, or we call it artificial in intelligence. Because you need a fast responding, fast calculating mathematical model to analyze the sample. So because when the instrument detects a particle in principle, it doesn't know what it is. But the mathematical model, if you're fed it, with a lot of reference images for every single particle you're interested in, say, pollen grains, birds, alternarius spores, um, and you just continue, then it can compare all those reference images with what it has uh, detected, and then it can decide what do we have in the air. But that's a lot of references. We need thousands of reference images for every single particle. So it takes time to make these reference images, but in the end, then we have potentially a um, real-time device that can recognize the different species. Pros and cons again, while it's a new technology, we don't have long time series. The strength is there's no person-specific uncertainty. And the uncertainty of the instrument, we can quantify this. So the middle figure to the right is just a typical example of how we can classify uh, accuracy for different pollen types. We can identify mm. the uncertainty. So we can quantify the uncertainty at the species level, but we can also quantify the uncertainty for the overall instrument. Furthermore, data, they are available in the real time and we have an expanding network. So a few years ago, we had something maybe five, 10 instruments in Europe, mm. and now we have certainly more. The higher temporal accuracy is also important because these instruments here, they suck in more air, they analyze more air compared to the traditional approach. This means whenever we are having small concentrations of the harmful biosols, it can provide a better estimate of what we have in there compared to the traditional approach. So this provides a better chance of early warning. Finally, the real-time data can feed into the modeling chain and improve forecasting accuracy. So that's the strengths. They do have weaknesses. The taxonomical detail is quite similar for the pollen grains, but limited for spores. It is improving, but again, it's not comparable for the time being. They're also very expensive, so there are large capital costs involved with this. Again, why is this important? Well, first, pollen and spore concentration, they vary dramatically over the day. There's a lower figure, there's two time series. The one to the left, it's a time series of grass pollen from the city of Aarhus, daily mean concentrations. The one to the right, hourly concentrations. So much higher concentrations. The y-axis is the same. Those that suffer from hay fever, they know by experience, once they're exposed to a high concentration of pollen grains, they get the response quite rapidly. So therefore, time resolution does matter. The real-time instruments, they can also provide timely information to the end users much faster than the traditional approach. And due to the higher sampling volume, they can provide better early warnings, which is very valuable for those that are most sensitive. 
Next slide, please. Yes. So again, summary, again, we have the backbone of the European pollen spore network. It's laboratory based, limited detection, time consuming, but a vast network and requires trained staff. The DMA methods, uh, also laboratory based, extreme detail. And as far as we know, it's the only known approach we can use to classify all biosols. Some methods are time consuming and expensive, but we need new skills. Take for the real time methods again, quick delivery to the end user, high temporal uh, detail. As with DNA methods, then the, this also requires new skills. But the take home message is really which method is best for monitoring of harmful biosols? We have it below. This depends on the objectives. State of the art, in this case, DNA methods, real time methods, can provide information quicker, higher detail, and use consistent methods based on known references. So certainly something that is applicable for the One Health approach. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Skjorth. And um, I invite again our audience online to uh, start uh, writing their questions and comments in the chat session, in the chat part, and then we will take them for discussion uh, later on. So now let's move on to our next speaker, mm -hmm. Professor Mikhail Sofia, who will guide us on how to use the technology to forecast anticipate bioaerosols in the air. Uh, professor Sofiev is a uh, adjunct professor at the University of Helsinki and deputy of atmospheric composition modeling and group leader at the Finnish Meteorological Institute. Uh, professor Sofiev has worked in the field of atmospheric physics and chemistry, concentrating on development and application of the Eulerian and Lagrangian air pollution models for meso to global scales in the troposphere and the stratosphere as well as operational air quality and accidental release dispersion forecasting. He is the coordinator of developmental system for integrated modeling of atmospheric composition. Dr. Sofia, Professor Sofia, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I will be talking about a pretty young direction in bioresolves in particular because the uh, bioresolve forecasting started barely 15 years ago. And uh, I'll try to cover a little bit of this history. I'll start from the message. Uh, thank you, just right slide. Uh, and uh, after that, I will go into a little bit of basics. What modeling do we mean? Uh, what, what is it? And then a couple of examples of what we know and what we don't know, and in the end, a little bit of summary. Next, please. So a short message, really short. So we have 15 years of evolution. That's not much. Uh, just to what uh, Karsten mentioned in previous time, we have something like 50 years of measurements at uh, Hearth uh, type device, and we have only 15 years of modeling. So how far we are. In fact, uh, we move pretty fast, and uh, I'll try to demonstrate further on that the instruments the models now became a useful tool used by uh, the, those who need them, used by the stakeholders, by policymakers even, and uh, certainly by allergy sufferers. Next, please. Yep, so uh, Vincent Rio already uh, said quite a few words about uh, this tiny scheme, which actually describes how we do the modeling. Similar to the approach of air quality modeling, and that's the principal point, we start from modeling the sources. We really simulate how the plants behave in, uh, in their real environment or as close to real as we could manage. And after that, drive the pollen uh, maturation, release, dispersion in the atmosphere, and removal. In the end, we get pollen concentration. So we are talking about the systems which can be first trained and calibrated using the measurements, and after that they can run without measurements. So they can provide not only forecasts in time, but also they can be used as uh, in the areas where measurements are not available or very scarce. Next, please. So uh, what do we have now? In fact, not too much, but uh, we have several models and uh, Vincent Re mentioned already Copernicus, uh, apart from these 11 models, which is an ensemble uh, covering whole Europe, 
uh, we have Sila, which uh, the system which I coordinate, and uh, that covers uh, 13 species now. Uh, and one thing, it's also covering Europe, of course, but the difficulty in covering Europe is that the resolution has to be quite coarse. We are not too good in mountain regions, and here we need something really much deeper and much higher resolving uh, than a European scale uh, Silamo Copernicus. And that is the Cosmo Art model, uh, which is uh, set in Alpine region with much higher resolution. And I'll show in a couple of minutes a, a few pictures from that part. So uh, for uh, forecast inside, we now have European area. Uh, we have Alpine region. There is a zoom to uh, Northern Europe and uh, within the last two years approximately, uh, country level uh, forecasts based on uh, the models I mentioned, uh, they start uh, being developed and several of them are already operational and the number is growing. Uh, up to five days, that's what we can predict. And the data from uh, those applications I'm aware of open. So in that sense, all, everyone can go to uh, the website, whether it's Copernicus, Silam, Cosmo Art, or, or other models, and get the information straight from there. Uh, one thing, uh, we are talking about climate change. The situation is changing, environment is moving. What is happening with Poland? And uh, uh, right now, just these days, the first European Poland reanalysis is being finalized. It will cover 40 years, 42 to be exact, from 1980 to 2022, based on the model and a simulation of available measurements. So after that, we will have a very detailed or as detailed as we can afford information about the pollen uh, development during the last 40 years. Uh, next, please. So how do the models uh, bring together, uh, come together with measurements? Uh, with that, I have to refer to a project which started just half a year ago, which tries to marry all the me measurement uh, components mentioned by uh, Carson in previous talk and the modeling component. And the answer is artificial intelligence and machine learning, which actually has capacity to bring these very diverse sources of information together. And yeah, I should also mention that uh, very recently it was shown that pollen can be visible even by weather lidars. And we already have a network over Europe. So if we manage to get this algorithm online and make it working, we will have three-dimensional image of pollen clouds over whole Europe. Next slide, please. So just a couple of examples that it actually works. It's nice to show some pictures but uh, and nice schemes, but let me try to show some uh, re real life examples. A couple of years ago, uh, what you see on the map, it was a blow from Southern Europe all the way to uh, Northern Finland of ragweed. Uh, this is the species which does not grow anywhere in uh, Finland. Okay, it, it, some bushes exist, but they do not flower practically. So this uh, dispersion distribution was all the way from Southern Europe throughout the whole continent. It was predicted five days ago, five days before, so we knew that it's coming and uh, got prepared to that. Uh, next slide, please. So the observations were uh, at place, and then this is what we saw uh, five days later. At the bottom picture, you see this one of the real-time devices, uh, which was uh, set in Helsinki. And you see that concentrations uh, jumped from uh, next to zero, basically the noise level in the device. They jumped up when the plume arrived and then gradually fade down a few days later. And you can compare uh, with the picture which depicts the first day, the first blow. And on the right hand side, you see this uh, more traditional measurements from four locations in Finland. This is the uh, Hearst type uh, devices, this standard uh, well-known good old instrument, which actually gave the uh, picture over the whole country. What was interesting is that the difference between the devices was noticeable and also between the model and devices was noticeable, but they were pretty much on the same page. So the uh, different approaches actually showed a very similar picture. Next slide, please. 
And a year later, uh, we had a very detailed uh, comparison, a possibility to directly uh, shoot uh, several devices on, in Helsinki and also run the model in operational mode there. And the uh, top uh, chart shows early trees, uh, alder, uh, birch, and uh, corylus. Uh, how they were observed. You see this uh, season was started from uh, alder and then continued with uh, birch uh, later on. And the bottom part is what the model said about the same season. We learned quite a bit from this small comparison, in particular that the start of the season is actually pretty good, but end of the season is, has some room to improvement. Next slide, please. And with this, uh, I'm coming to uh, more general question about quality of the forecasts. We all used to com complain about bad weather forecast. Last thing we want is that people start complaining about bad pollen forecast. So uh, we took, uh, yes, Isabella, we don't like this, <laughs> but we know that people do complain. Uh, so the most important parameter for us uh, was start of the season, because this is what allergy sufferers feel most. When the season is ongoing, it's already old story. They know that things are difficult for them. So the most important parameter is the temporal correlation of the um, and the season start. So this picture uh, depicts the uh, temporal correlation for four species predicted by Copernicus Ensemble. And uh, whatever is reddish or pinkish, it means good prediction. So the correlation is uh, 0.7 or something like this. This is what we routinely have for air quality as well. So in fact, the bioaerosol prediction uh, skills now approximately about the same as air quality prediction skills. Next, please. And this is the start of the season. On the left slide, on the left picture, whatever is yellow, it means exact heat. So within accuracy of plus minus one day, we were able to predict when the season will start. Uh, having that, uh, let me also confess a bit some difficulty. The upper picture uh, depicts the start of the clinically relevant season. That is a new definition uh, released by the Academy of Allergology and Clinical Immunology just a couple of years ago. We tried it for the first time in the year 2022 to evaluate how well we predict the start of the clinically relevant season, not only the beginning of the pollen flight, but also the absolute levels. It's together in the clinically relevant season. Uh, you see there is some job to do. Uh, next, please. Uh, maybe quickly about dissemination part. Uh, there are plenty of instruments, plenty of ways to predict, uh, present them, forecasts, analysis, measurements, retrospective measurements. They come with different timing, they come with different skills, they come with different quality, and they come with different uh, coverage. So if we think about European wide picture, it's model predictions. Uh, that's basically the only information we have now for the whole Europe. They are entirely open and then can be obtained from uh, Copernicus or from institutes who run these models. Uh, there is European Aeroallergen Network, EAN, and uh, that one provides the country-based mosaic, uh, depending on the measurements. That, uh, those, uh, that information is based on measurements alone. And there is plenty of commercial applications. If you go to Google Store or App Store and Google for Poland, you will find maybe hundreds of them already by now. Uh, my difficulty with all of, with many of them, not all of them, but with many of them, we don't know what the sources of information are. The pictures might be very nice, but uh, that's not uh, everything. And the countrywide, uh, countrywide, that's the National Pollen Information Services. They exist in every country or in most countries. And uh, mobile apps and the emerging part is the out of pollen uh, real-time data, which will be available to everyone. They will be open. And the health hub, which Vincent Real already mentioned. Next slide, please. So the Message is a little bit longer now. The first sentence is the same. And the second one is the challenges. So the model predictions are used in several countries, probably in many countries. I might not be aware about some of them. And they go in conjunction with observations. Uh, it, one example is here about Norco up, 
Another one is in Meteo Suisse, where the forecasts are uh, going model and measurements go together, and, and several others as well. Uh, but the Europe-wide, the common ground is yet to be established. I show the mosaic, but uh, modelers are in happy position. We have our unifying uh, center with CAMS. For measurements, it's more complicated, and uh, in organizational and in legislative part, it's even more complicated. And the mid to long-term prospects are comparatively unclear, okay, except for CAMS once again. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sophia. And uh, just a quick comment, because I think the dissemination part is also very important, because at the end of the day, the end users of those technology are the people living with patients and living with allergy and asthma. So it's important to understand how to monitor and to uh, prevent um, pollen and uh, bioaerosols. So um, talking about patients, so, so far we have listened from our scientific, uh, the scientific perspective on how bioaerosol can impact health um, and how developments in research uh, allow us to monitor and forecast uh, bioaerosol in the air, but as I said before, what about the patients? What about uh, people living with allergy and their ways diseases? So I'm very happy to give the floor to our next speaker and my colleague, uh, Isabel Proagno. Mrs. Proagno is a deputy director at the European Federation of Allergy and Airways Disease Patients Association, IFA, uh, which is an umbrella patient group that uh, gather 20, 45 national allergy, asthma, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient association in 26 European countries. Isabel joined IFA in, 20, in 2014 and now leads the IFA policy and communication towards the EU institutions and WHO Europe on IFA pillars, which are the inform, prevent and care, specifically on uh, health and care policies, including digitalization, environmental files impacting health, such as air pollution and climate change, tobacco and smoking, food labeling and chemical exposure. Uh, Isabel is also IFA representative to the European Medicine Agency and to the Health and Emergency Response Authority. She's a board member of the European Patients Forum. Uh, she studied journalism and political science and has a Master of Arts on European Integration from the College of Europe. So, very happy and uh, to leave the floor to, to Isabel. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you, uh, Mr. Olekas, for hosting this important um, discussion today. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to represent patients today, and it's a real responsibility, um, because uh, while I was listening to many of the presentations about detectors and, and, and sensors, I realized that I am representing the human sensors uh, in the room today. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we have already uh, listened from our excellent speakers how much bioaerosols uh, are linked to allergy and asthma. Uh, there are very common, con common chronic diseases strongly linked with climate, and I would like to uh, attract attention to this uh, map. We have seen many maps today which is the map of prevalence only to ratwick pollen. Uh, this is a, an estimation of, uh, on the uh, left side of the map, you will see that um, that was the prevalence to ratwick pollen uh, between 86 and 2005, and that the estimation uh, for two, 2041, so in 20 years' time, um, it is really uh, worrisome, especially in Central Europe. Uh, there is an estimation that we will raise from 33 patients, 33 million patients in Europe to 77 million just in 20 years if nothing is done. So there is a rapidly increase in prevalence driven by uh, the temperatures, driven by the expansion of allergenic diseases and species. Can we move forward? Thank you very much. So the health burden of bioaerosols, allergy to pollen often starts in childhood. So we are talking about uh, children prevalence. Many of uh, the patients uh, that are represented by uh, the 45 organizations at IFA are actually 
parents, families impacted by uh, allergy, allergic rhinitis. It is one of the most prevalent chronic diseases in childhood. It has a debilitating impact. It affects quality of life. It's wheezing, shortness of breath, nasal congestion, swollen, irritable eyes. It's not just the airways. It impacts all your sinus. And that requires a lot of treatment. To start with, antihistaminics, nasal decongestion sprays, eye drops. There is no magic solution for each patient. Uh, on top of that, they are linked with uh, comorbidities. Studies have shown that the coexistence of rhinitis, atopic eczema, and asthma is very likely. So children with one of these diseases at the age of four are four to seven times more likely to have two or three of them. So it's not just about allergy. It's about uh, many other diseases that add on to the cocktail. Next slide, please. We have heard, heard also uh, from previous speakers that uh, there is a lot of cost into uh, allergy treatment and, um, and that it costs on the quality of life. You see here that uh, pollen is linked with a broad range of socioeconomic costs, including the direct health costs, which are diagnosis, medical and treatment costs, and also the indirect, which are absenteeism from work and school, productivity loss, impaired sleep. Some of the examples are, uh, for example, for uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis, approximately almost 1,000 euro per patient per year. Uh, for ragweed pollen allergy, almost 565 euro per patient per, per year. But the overall costs in Europe is around 7.5 billion euro per year. Um, is this something that we accept uh, from IFA? We are calling for action. And this is where we go for the next slide. So uh, it has been many years that we have been requesting a European Union action on, uh, on bioaerosols because the burden is extensive and there is increasing relevance. But for many years, and uh, many of the speakers in the, in the table here today, we have heard from the EU institutions that pollen emissions are not from man-made activities and hence cannot be reduced by member state, state action, which means not by regulation. However, bioaerosols are strongly linked with the human activity. Uh, we, have, uh, we are looking into global warming and, and climate deregulation, and we have heard um, from that before, there is uh, industrial emissions from transportation and housing because we know that certain pollutants such as CO2, NO2 or SO2 lead to faster growth of allergenic plants because of natural emissions from agriculture and city planning, because city planning does not take into account sometimes pollen allergy. And for example, highly allergenic trees are planted close to people's houses and schools. We are referring to birds elder, hazelnut, cypress. So IFA is calling, has been calling for many years now, and I can recall that in 2013, we launched with the European Respiratory Society, the Allergology Society, and the Aerobiology Society calls to have a truly EU-wide real-time pollen monitoring network, something that will help us to project, like uh, we have heard from, from Copernicus program, for example, so to know when is the, the pollen season is starting because the treatment needs to start before, otherwise you are already treating organs that are inflamed. And also uh, something that is accessible for the patient because I haven't met a patient yet that is accessing Copernicus data. Um, next slide, please. So where are bioaerosols in EU and global policy? Well, we have encouraging developments brought by the EU Green Deal uh, in the last years with the von der Leyen Commission. We have the EU Climate Adaptation Strategy, which acknowledges the risks of airborne uh, allergens and refers to the need to gain a better understanding on the impact of health. And for that, there is a pilot project called the European Climate and Health Observatory that was also created in 2021 and that is piloted by uh, the European Environmental Agency and the Commission, the, the Commission, uh, the DG Environment. And one of the uh, priorities that they have been looking at is precisely the connection between in, um, heat, uh, heated stress uh, in plants to uh, pollen to uh, 
um, to allergy and asthma. So this is very welcome data uh, that is actually emanating from, from the speakers on the table. There is also the Zero Pollution Action Plan that is looking into how pollution is, uh, is also affecting he uh, care. Uh, we also have learnings from COVID-19. Uh, there is the One Health uh, approach and the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response. They are looking into health threats um, to be better prepared. And one of the things at the table right now is especially environmental health. And I have brought uh, in the name of IFA the example of uh, airborne and uh, um, bioaerosols and exposure to um, to allergy and asthma. Uh, scientific is innovation is now also uh, coming to us. We have heard about the many uh, techniques and uh, forecasts that exist right now, but there are also tools such as the European Allergy Network, we've heard the personal allergy symptom forecasting and metropolin, which however tend to have a more local character and might not be uh, directly used by, by the patient. At international level standard agencies, we have also seen the development of the updated WHO air quality guidelines, which actually uh, point, pinpoint that, um, that uh, one of the pioneering um, research that need to happen for the next maybe update is precisely the disconnection of aeroallergens with air pollution. And finally, uh, there is another uh, just this year development that the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change on the COP28 that will take place in Abu Dhabi will have for the first time in history a health program. So we as a community, doctors, academia, patients together, we should be there uh, bringing this issue further. Next slide, please. So for our new One Health approach that tackles bioaerosols, we need to develop the breathing chapter of the EU One Health approach. Connect the dots between plant health and human health. I think we patients, we are connected. We, we, we don't need a sensor to tell us, hey, you are exposed to uh, this kind of allergen. We know it, we need to take medicine. But if policies start to acknowledge that and plan for it, uh, we could use and we could move beyond the use of biocides, this food consumption and safety that is currently uh, one of the focus of the One Health approach at the European Union level and the biodiversity loss, which is uh, linked more to, towards food security and draw the links with underlying factors for chronic diseases who, while uh, taking the uh, spectrum of infectious diseases. We would like uh, that the European Union adopts a holistic framework for from air quality, moving from regulating emission sources to a public health approach. So fully embed bioaerosols and specifically pollen, the, its monitoring, evaluation, information and care, especially because some of the networks that exist at the moment um, do not have enough funding and has to, have to be funded in some countries by patient associations there is a question of equity here to basic prevention of disease and finally address the health threats uh, to plant health and prepared accordingly my last question my last slide refers to uh to the entrance of the European Parliament. In the semicircle, there are several priorities, and the first one is health first. Yes, health first, but all health. The health of allergy and asthma patients too, and one health. And just to conclude, this is not a cost. Prevention is not a cost. It is always an investment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Isabel, and also for sharing these um, insights and also these avenues for improvement that we have in front of us. Now, uh, to stay on the patient's uh, perspective, still, um, I'm, I'm very um, happy to introduce our, our next speaker, Professor Athanasios Damialis. Professor Damialis is a professor at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, um, and uh, he's the head of the Arabology Group of the Department of Environmental Medicine uh, of the University of Augsburg in Germany. He has been engaged in research since 1996, always with an inter interdisciplinary field of aerobiology, biometeorology, and health impact. So, Professor Damialis, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Also, I should add that I'm also now affiliated with the Salt University of Thessaloniki and uh, doing research on climate change, specifically and ecology. Mm -hmm. First of all, I would like to express how happy I am that uh, we are all sitting down here today. And uh, I would like also to thank for the initiative that uh, we are brought together, all of us here. Uh, so I would like, if we go to the next slide, I would like to give today a talk about the patients' needs and opportunities, and I would have two paradoxes here. Uh, the first one is that actually I am a patient, so let me bear with me so as to say what I was, what was happening to me when I was a child and what still happens to me sometimes. And the second is that we talk about opportunities, but actually sometimes it's a nice way, not the best, but it's a nice way to discuss about opportunities, talking about missed opportunities. So if we go to the next slide, we will see through my eyes or of an average asthmatic child that in the 70s or 90s or 80s, uh, more or less allergies were not really diagnosed. We didn't have really allergology in most of the countries as, in, as a medical specialty. Uh, also allergic patients for this reason were not efficiently, if at all, treated. Uh, also because of lack of exposure, but also because of uh, lack of uh, equipment and uh, know-how, as was mentioned before by the previous speakers, uh, we didn't really check sensitization except for basic skin, usually, challenges. And uh, I don't need to talk about exposure. Exposure was based on technologies, as was mentioned before, that was uh, from the 50s, if it was assessed at all. We talk about 70s and 80s. What happens nowadays? So, of course, many things have improved, many new technologies, many much more experience and expertise. So allergy and asthma uh, is much easily and efficiently diagnosed today. It has high accuracy. We don't talk anymore about sensitization, but actually we talk also about multi-sensitization and can be easily evaluated. That's why we can talk also about co-exposure nowadays and cross-reactivities and so on. Uh, however, the problem still seems to lie on the technologies and on the way we try to calculate still exposure because you will still, in the biggest extent, use uh, the technology from the 50s. And even more, as was mentioned before, we use privately owned exposure data. And uh, the patient's uh, treatment has dramatically improved, of course, yes, but still there is this gap with exposure. And in the next slide, if I put also the factor of climate change in the game, next slide, please. Uh, this is what we usually refer to. So what we usually refer to is the anthropocentric approach of uh, how uh, radiation versus air pollution and also organic volatile compounds, indoors and outdoors, including also stress, neurological disorders, pathogens, many different things of exposure. As I mentioned, multi-exposure. Lately, we had COVID, so also, of course, microbes and many, many others. And human is in the center, and we try to see how we are affected by all these different things, and that's exactly wrong, because actually that's not how it is in the concept of one health. If we go to the next slide, please. And one click more. So practically what we know is that climate change, regardless of what happens to the environment, but also to the patient, uh, what we have is practically changing data. It doesn't matter in the beginning how we define it, we just know that data are changing. And as was mentioned before, I think by Professor Sofiev, uh, that uh, sometimes they change so fast that we cannot keep up with. And it doesn't matter to get into details and talk about, you see the bold marked words like urbanization, uh, genetically modified crops, uh, temperature, eutrophication, air pollution, it doesn't matter how we define it, but imagine we're exposed to each and every one of them every day, each one of us. Next slide, please. And if I want to be a bit more dramatic, but actually it's not me, it's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, they say that, as we mentioned, again mentioned before, so bear with me, sometimes you share things that you have shared already, but it's very important to hear such data and results many times. So non-communicable diseases are responsible for 3.7 million deaths yearly. 3.7 million deaths yearly. Allergies, of course, belong to that, and it's a uh, number one cause, to my knowledge, and the evidence is very high, so that's what happens because of climate change, and that's what we expect to continue happening, even worsening. Next slide, please. 
And if I want to be a bit more, uh, allow me the expression hardcore, uh, yeah, we have also war, we have climate change, we have migration, we have climate change migration, and we have also financial migration since the 2008, 2010. Uh, if I add all this into the game, this means that actually we don't have just to calculate exposure and define patients, we have to reevaluate patients, because if I was a patient in Ukraine, but then moved to Germany and then moved to Greece, who knows, uh, then, of course, my exposure also changes plasma sensitization, my medical services, my diet, exposure to pollution, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, the same is true also for uh, new plants or invasive plants, as it's called in ecology, so plants that we didn't have some time ago, and they are very happy when there is pollution because that's how they grow. They are nitrophiles, as they're called. Uh, one typical example, and also uh, an issue of an EU-funded uh, action, the Smarter Cost Action, uh, is about ambrosia. I will not say lots of things. You see in the maps that actually we seem to have an increasing prevalence of ambrosia. It's a good thing because of this project, actually, there has been some eradication, but uh, not as simple, of course, because, as I said, it's invasive species, nicely ad uh, adapting to high pollution sites. Next slide, please. And if I continue saying about opportunities or even uh, not yet missed opportunities, but we'll see in a while. So if we discuss about synergies of biologists and air pollution, we see, as already mentioned in the One Health approach, that it's not just about pollen, it's also about air pollution, it's also about nitrogen dioxide, it's also about urbanization and many other things that we cannot possibly, because of money usually, and simplicity, to include in a single paper or multiple papers. So here you see that it's not just that higher temperature advances pollen and flowering seasons. Of note, different uh, species, different years, different countries, same result. More temperature, more nitrogen dioxide, more urbanization, earlier seasons. How does it translate to symptoms? That's a big story. That's the answer to answer the question to answer today. Next slide, please. And uh, if we talk about pollen bobs, thank you for the parallelism, Isabella. Uh, I like also to talk about pollen and fungal clouds. So <laughs> it is about multi-exposure. So I will not again give details about the experimental mm -hmm. part of flying an actual real airplane and trying to see if we have any pollen or fungal spores high there up on the air, because we usually we expect that our exposure is here. Our exposure is where we walk, where we live and so on. But frankly, we have literally pollen clouds and fungus spore clouds above our heads, as New York Times showed in the picture to the right, that actually could fall on our heads or better in our lungs at any time. And uh, this shows the importance again of uh, climate change and extreme events, we will see also in the next slides, and how things could happen even worse when, for example, we have a thunderstorm, and we mentioned already the example of thunderstorm asthma, and that's again a missed opportunity, unfortunately, a good example, but unfortunately, because we had 10 deaths, is about Melbourne in 2016, where actually in, within just a few, a few hours, 3.4 thousand people uh, sought emergency, either in emergency calls or emergency units, and uh, 10 of them unfortunately uh, died. And uh, there has been some research since then, but uh, actually the missed opportunity is that now we know, now we have the expertise, that we know that with lightnings and thunderstorms, we have more pollen. Here it happens in the graph to show grass pollen because it's a big, let's say, responsible, but of course can be many other things, including fungus spores, and many others that maybe we don't know yet. And uh, this increases the asthma cases. But uh, what is the missed opportunity here, and now it's the good opportunity, is that actually Australia, to my knowledge, is the best and maybe only one still that has a real-time risk alert about thunderstorms. That shows exactly how we needed a missed opportunity to create a new opportunity. Next slide, please. And uh, in case somebody says, OK, well, what, what is this craziness about thunderstorm and thunderstorm asthma? I mean, we didn't have it like in the 90s, right? Well, actually, you're right. And actually, I can show you what we expect to have according to IPCC again. Uh, in the future, if we have the different scenarios, so the two up graphs is about temperature, it's nice to see it. So darker colors, more uh, prevalence, higher frequency. The down pair of uh, figures is about uh, Daily precipitation is how much precipitation we have per daily. So it has to do with, again, thunderstorms and, of course, amounts uh, within a short interval of time. And if I go to the down right, which is the pessimistic scenario, which probably we're closer to that based on how we go on as a society, uh, so plus three degrees increase of uh, Celsius degrees. So we see that uh, most of, the, of Europe becomes dark. 
and uh, that shows that uh, it could imply, if not prove, that uh, we have a higher chance of uh, thunderstorms. You see what happens to Scandinavia, what happens to Central Europe, and also specific areas, including my hometown, Thessaloniki. So we could expect that we have more thunderstorm, maybe more asthma. That's an assumption. Next slide, please. And uh, if we talk about opportunities, we also had a missed opportunity, but also we have new opportunities because now we know. So it's uh, the example of COVID and uh, the role of virosols. So, so far we talk about pollen, fungi. We talked also, Professor Stjoth, about uh, bacteria, viruses, and we always talk about the frame of one shelf. So we know that allergy is an environmental disease. We know that half of us in this room and also half of the European population and global population will suffer from allergy by 2050, half of us. Uh, we also know that uh, in 2007, the IPCC, in their report by that time, actually they had warned us about a, a forthcoming pandemic. They even mentioned the word coronavirus. Uh, what do we do as a society? Actually nothing, at least nothing in terms of uh, really dealing with it or preparing for such a thing. Uh, and we see in the right uh, part that uh, in many papers, including Nature, uh, climate change papers, we see that actually viruses and bacteria and this kind of microbes that are, we don't even know uh, 10 or 20 percent of what we have as biodiversity. Uh, this is the big problem and is going to be the big problem. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that practically we knew in what happened, what we would expect to happen in the COVID-19 pandemic, that <clears throat> practically we have uh, something going on in combination with virosols. So practically, it's an old story with a new ending. So we know that pollen seasons become earlier, which means that they co start coinciding with viruses seasons. Also, we mentioned already that pollen have higher abundances, which means we have an added burden of co-exposure. And we know already, we knew already, that uh, we had many cases for different viruses, about RSV, human rhinovirus, about 12 different viruses in South Korea, and many different uh, countries, actually, and many different uh, sites and countries and uh, years. And we know that actually we had a combination of uh, pollen, but generally bioresource and viruses. And the next slide, actually, the big question was, is it true for SARS-CoV-2? And actually it was and is true for SARS-CoV-2. And we know also the mechanism. I will not get into details. We know that uh, the antiviral proteins that normally our body pro produces to deal with viruses, any virus, including SARS-CoV-2, we know that actually this is prohibited to act as it should uh, when we are inhaling pollen, for example. And the next slide is what also already <coughs> Professor Anes Maizano mentioned. So we try to do, and that's a great opportunity. So the complaint, if I may, is that this opportunity should come from 248 monitoring stations and 154 co-authors, practically by chance, almost all speakers here are co-authors in this paper today. And uh, it's interesting because it would be so nice, so more efficient and effective if we would have this data like that and just be able to warn people because we didn't, except for specific countries, as far as I know, it could be Switzerland, it could be Finland, it could be Greece. Uh, most of the other cases, they didn't know that apart from the normal usual suspects of, for example, air pollution, that they were co-responsible from environmental factors, apart from uh, conduct for more coronavirus cases. One of them was also pollen. And I bet that most of the people in the world don't even know that. That's a missed opportunity. Next slide, please. And another missed opportunity, but uh, it's nice now that we know, since we talk also about urban planning, is that uh, uh, China in 2008, actually before 2008, so 2005 actually, uh, they were proud of announcing that they will make the Green Olympics, that they will make the greenest Olympics because they had a lot of air pollution. So of course, they wanted to show that air pollution will not be a problem in Beijing, China. The, what they made practically is that they still were the most polluted Olympic event until today. But plus, they added to this exposure for the, the elite athletes uh, some thousands of allergenic trees because that way they thought that they would deal with air pollution. And then they had, as urban planning for the Olympic Games of Beijing, they had actually uh, the highly allergenic pollen plus uh, the air pollution. And this was not the best, as you can see from many papers regarding the performances and other allergic reactions of Olympic athletes. Next slide, please. And I would like to finish, I hope I'm within time, with a take-home message that actually it's not about if we want new technologies, if we want funding, if we want uh, to include it, be included in any directive, one health or air quality. The problem here is that actually we are sick, and I'm talking as a patient, and we are going to be sicker actually, and also our children will get sick, and that's not my words, that's IPCC. And uh, the good news 
and the opportunities that actually the uh, scientific community and I think also the society is mature. We have the technology, we have the know-how, we know that we have a common enemy, which is climate change, but practically, to be more practical, the real enemy is actually time, because we don't have any time to lose. We know it. It's already, we discussed about 1.5 degrees plus or plus 3 degrees, and we are probably already, already losing the game. And uh, what we know is that allergic patients need information on their exposure, no matter how it's defined, but it has to be centrally. And avoidance, we know until today, is the first line of defense. And the last slide, please. And I would like to mention a missed opportunity and offer in the table and hopefully have a fruitful discussion later about uh, writing new history books, potentially, today, because uh, in uh, mid-2000, if I'm not wrong, in the European Union Parliament, actually it was unfortunately quoted uh, by that time that climate change was not as popular as today. Why should we care if the polar bear gets extinct? That was largely in the news by that time. And uh, let's hope that in another one or two decades, maybe the news by that time, they don't say that, you know, these guys had some opportunity in 2023, and uh, we don't have to wait another two decades to actually do something about it. And as I said, not about us, but about half of the population that is going to be sick from allergies. And let's hope that this doesn't write in the news, in any newspaper in the future. And uh, if we do care, and I guess all of us do, about the health and well-being of uh, us and our children, it would be great to start discussing about integrating biorosal monitoring in urban planning and also air quality directives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Damialis. I think uh, that you deliver a very clear message. Um, and also thank you for putting your research uh, at work to improve the patient's quality of life. So now without further delay, uh, let's move on to the joint statement. And, um, and I will leave the floor to Professor Ingrida Shauliene. Uh, Professor Soliene is doctor in biomedical science with specialization on botany. She, she is chief researcher at Vilnius University of Lithuania, and now she's president of the European Aerobiology Society. Professor Soliene, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I just uh, say that not the now president, I, the past president, yes. we have a different one now. Uh, Georgina Belmonte now is mm -hmm. the president, but uh, the, today, uh, my mission, oh, I took the, the honor to, to announce the statement, uh, um, but uh, first uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Oleg as to open doors to European Parliament for this question, because it's uh, um, sounds a bit hidden from the, all the points what is related to the um, people health and um, all the um, groups uh, uh, in, uh, connected with the projects, with the societies, uh, they um, prepared a statement which I uh, will share with the audience today and hope it will be read uh, more often than uh, we have already today. Uh, so uh, today our focus is on bioaerosols and their impact on al uh, asthma and allergies. It is alarming to know that uh, uh, over 100 million Europeans suffer from allergy rhinitis or asthma, making them the most common non-infection diseases for children and the second most common for adult after heart diseases. Unfortunately, uh, international information about aeroallergens is inconsistent and not easily accessible when it is needed. Uh, uh, as a result, many allergy patients are untreated, worsening the symptoms. We urgently need to provide the public with a trusted and reliable information. This requires improving monitoring, forecasting, and communication tools. By making information more available, available, we can reduce the burden of disease and improve the well-being of affected individuals. And the next slide is the next point in the statement uh, regarding the climate change. We already had significant impact on the uh, allergy patients 
we witnessed changes in the pollen seasons, increased concentrations of aeroallergens, and the exposure to new mixes of allergenic particles. And as the climate change continues, these effects will only intensify, posing major challenges for public health. It is crucial that we deepen our understanding on how aeroallergens interact with air pollutions. This knowledge is essential for predicting and effectively mitigating future exposure, as well as grasping uh, implications of climate change on the allergic population. By prioritizing prioritizing these efforts, we can proactively address the potential consequences on aller aller allergens, ensuring the healthy environment and better quality for everyone's life. The next slide is um, yeah, about the uh, technologies uh, which in recent year made incredible advancement and transformed our real knowledge about aeroallergens. Now, thanks to great uh, uh, to new techniques, we have the power to identify individual bio, biorosal particles in real time. The application of real time information to forecasting has been presented to us today, resulting in significant improvement in accuracy. It's great to see that these advancements align with the, the level commonly observed in traditional air quality monitoring practice. Furthermore, several regions and countries have successfully implemented operational real-time monitoring system for bioresolves and the number of monitoring sites continuously growing. These collaborative efforts are paving the way and shaping the future where comprehensive and accurate information about bioresol will be readably available and together Armed with their advanced knowledge, we can make significant strides in controlling asthma and allergy. The next slide is uh, focusing that uh, it is important um, to acknowledge that the benefits of real-time bioresol monitoring extend far beyond the human health. These innovative technologies provide crucial insights for agriculture and silvicultural activities open new avenues for improvement and sustainability. They offer essential information for detect uh, pathogenic fungal spores and targeted inventions, uh, as well as accurate prediction of fruit production in crops like olives or grapes. By embarrassing this proactive approach, we can protect our crops and foster healthy environmental for everyone. <clears throat> the next slide. Uh, but, but the European air quality monitoring and legislation currently overlook the biological components, including aeroallergens. Recognizing the significance of bioresolves for human health, animal health, and the environment, it's crucial to include them in le European legislation. One way forward, we would be recognize aeroallergens as semi-natural pollutants that are released into uh, air from both natural sources and human-driven activities. By bridging this gap, we empower individuals, organizations, and policymakers to make informed uh, decisions and take prompt action. It's essential that we address this issue head-on, safeguarding public health, protecting ecosystems, and ensuring a sustainable future. To address the related issues, the next slide. We have few specific recommendations to the European policymakers. Uh, improving the legislative uh, framework to include uh, the monitoring of semi-natural pollutants such as aeroallergens. Developing open and trusted communication channels that provide reliable, accurate, and timely information about aeroallergens concentration in real time, encouraging future research on the effects of pollen and spores on health, including the presence of other pollutants based on the new data uh, these efforts will provide. Facilitate the development and technology and infrastructure to uh, 
future extend agriculture applications of biorosol monitoring and forecasting. We kindly implore policymakers to support these measures as they will undoubtedly lead uh, to reduction in disease burden, diminish health inequalities, minimize agricultural losses, and mitigate environmental damages. Let's take proactive steps to protect public health. For more information or inquiries, please feel free to reach out to the supporting organization uh, listed here, and uh, they will provide uh, a few further assistance and support uh, with, any, with any you need. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Sauliene. Um, so, um, and for running us through, through the joint statement. So for those in the room, we printed some copies and we distributed copies that you can find on your desk. For those who are joining online, the statement will be soon published and accessible to everyone who wants to use it. We will also send it to the participants, to all the registered participants to the today event. Now let's move on to the discussion. We have 10 minutes left for today. So if uh, you have from the public in attendance here at the European Parliament, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and state your name, your occupation, and who are you addressing your questions to. Let's see if uh, you already have some questions in, uh, in mind. Otherwise, we can uh, um, open the question that we received from our online uh, participants. Uh, I think that we already have some. Okay, yes, we received uh, quite a few uh, questions. So let's say um, the first question is about these thunderstorm asthma. Can Europe have uh, thunderstorm asthma, asthma? This is one of the questions from our audience online. Maybe Isabella want to, to take this. Yes, because I published uh, since uh, the beginning, and uh, we have also some uh, clinical skill because uh, we could uh, save uh, one uh, woman that was uh, pregnant and that had asthma attacks. Uh, so, in but this is uh, not for real. I think uh, this is a, a phenomenon uh, that uh, happens uh, uh, because the pollen uh, before the thunderstorm. Uh, go up due to the turbulence of the air and the fragment, and then uh, uh, small pieces of uh, these pollens can be breathed by people uh, that have, uh, uh, I mean, and go in the airways. So this is dangerous for people that have uh, an allergic uh, uh, predisposition. Uh, so far, uh, a lot for people with uh, pollen, mm, sorry, a fever, I was using the French term, but uh, uh, also obviously for asthmatics, in general asthmatics, they are controlled, but when uh, there are many, many pollens, uh, this can be dangerous for, for uh, new patient, uh, for well-established patient, etc. So, and uh, what's the problem? The problem is that, uh, for example, this here, uh, year, sorry, we uh, saw so many thunderstorms. They are, uh, the number is increasing due to, uh, to climate changes. Uh, they are uh, before in the season, there is an anticipation. So this is uh, really a problem that is uh, uh, increasing. I want to add, uh, uh, Thanos uh, uh, said that, uh, that uh, even a fungus spores can be dangerous in such a situation because uh, in some way there is a sort of a natural aerosol <laughs> that people inhale. And so everything, can, there are some hypotheses even on other uh, kind of, uh, so uh, a potential danger for, uh, for patient new or uh, old patient and increasing. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Isabel. Yes, something? please. Uh, so the question is not really, should be, not really if we have thunderstorm asthma in Europe, but if we are going to have thunderstorm asthma in Europe. For example, in Germany, we did analysis, retrospective analysis with uh, lots of patients, thousands of patients uh, from Bavaria, Germany, and we saw that there is a significant but weak association. So it is weak. 
But, <clears throat> and if I may talk again as a patient, I didn't have thunderstorm asthma a few years before. I started here in the last two, three years, which means that I can accurately forecast you five minutes before if we're going to have a thunderstorm. And that's amazing because I'm not a severe pollen allergic. I am a house dust mite allergic and many other allergens, but not really outdoor, which means because we saw it in the German uh, study actually, that it's a combination and compilation of factors also in the One Health approach of air pollution, NO2, PM2.5, PM10. So the combination of all these factors together with allergens, especially for those that are highly allergic, that this can cause really dramatic uh, effects. And the second thing is that let's not forget, if we talk about Europe, that thunderstorms liked specific bioclimatic regions, for example, high altitude. That's why maybe we haven't seen it so much in the urban environments that we usually live. But what we know now from climate change, and I will give the example of Mediterranean, is that we change dramatically climate. So Mediterranean is forecasted by IPCC to be literally subtropical by 2050, which means a lot of thunderstorms, a lot of rainy summers. So I would anticipate, therefore, that maybe we have lots of thunderstorm asthma in the Mediterranean the next 20, 30 years. We had the men in Paris, which is very strange. I mean, now, just now. So something is happening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, we, have, um, we have another uh, question. Very quickly, if we can answer in one minute, that would be, that would be great. So um, it's about uh, the coverage of measurement station across Europe uh, that will allow us to rely on bioaerosol forecast models, as we do in case of meteorology forecast. And I think that maybe this is Carsten or um, Michael. But really, one minute answer. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think I'll take it within 60 seconds, yes. Great. So uh, we're talking about the network of real-time devices. Uh, today, there is something like 50 of them. The number has grown from 15 uh, three years ago to 50 this year, uh, plus minus a little bit. The problem is that uh, models are not yet using this data in real time, and that's what we are going to change. So today, models go their way, measurements go their way. When they are combined, and that is done so far in Meteor Swiss only, uh, that will be a game changer. But uh, quite a few models are preparing to that. So thank you. That was quick. Thank you so much. So unfortunately, we are running out of time, but we will uh, make sure that all of your questions will be sent to our panelists today in, uh, in written so you can answer to, uh, to the question um, as well. So I want to really thank you all the speakers that joined us today for this really insightful discussion on One Health and Bioaerosols. Um, but I will leave now the floor to Dr. Olekas uh, for some uh, conclusive points. <laughs> You know, the, in the European Parliament, the typical time for uh, speech is one minute in the plenary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and I, I would like to thank all participants who, for being with us together and all people who, are, who have been online. I am feeling the most stronger uh, for, for, for that, but I get the information. I, I think we will have the good possibility to discuss in our intergroup and also I will discuss with my colleagues from the a subcommittee of health in the and the committee that we have the good basis for for discussion or maybe changing some uh, our uh, documents in your Euro, in european uh, level also i would like to uh, thank uh, ingrid Shouliani because you convinced me in Shouliani to to start to organize this this event um, thank you everyone and good health for our, our patients and for all our European citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you and uh, really warm thanks again to our speakers, our public that joined us in the room and also online uh, to launch this important joint statement on One Health and Bioaerosols. So this event has been recorded and will be posted in the interest group channels. Also a report summarizing the discussion and the takeaway points will uh, be uh, at your uh, disposal. Now, for further information on the activities of the interest group on allergy and asthma, please visit the website allergyasthmaparliament.org. Thanks to all organizing partners, the European Aerobiology Society, the International Society of Biometeorology, the International Association for Aerobiology, Net Auto Poland, the Adopt Cost Action, and IFA. I wish you all a very nice evening. Thank you.